Welcome to Overlooked, a podcast by Tunuka Media. My name is Yemi, and I'll be your host for the show. In this podcast, I introduce you to potentially overlooked news stories from around the world. This will include the good, the bad, and sometimes the absolutely hilarious. To keep you informed, I pick up stories that may have been missed by your home news network. The Overlooked podcast is produced every week and covers news articles from the previous week. Come back often, share with your friends, and feel free to add the podcast on your favorite podcast listening app. My goal is to make sure you have a pleasant and engaging listening experience every single time you tune in. So drop me a note on Twitter or Facebook. Just search for Tunuka Media. That is T-U-N-U-K-A Media. Episodes are also hosted on YouTube on the Tunuka Media YouTube channel. Again, that is T-U-N-U-K-A Media. Links to the stories will also be posted in the show notes. Finally, if you come across stories or articles that you think should be featured here, please share them and let us all keep informed. Now, let's get to this week's episode. So in our first story, we're going to be talking about a controversial proposal to sell the .org domain name for more than a billion dollars. The Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, that is I-C-A-N-N, a nonprofit that oversees the internet domain name system, has rejected a controversial proposal to sell the .org domain name to a private equity group for more than a billion dollars. It's a serious and possibly fatal blow to a proposal that had had few supporters besides the organization that actually proposed it. Currently, the .org domain registry is run by the Public Interest Registry, or PIR, a nonprofit subsidiary of another nonprofit called the Internet Society. So it's like an inception of nonprofits. PIR was created in 2002 to run the .org domain and has been doing so ever since. But in November 2019, the Internet Society stunned the nonprofit world by announcing that it would sell the PIR and effectively ownership of the domain to a private equity firm called Ethos Capital for more than a billion dollars. The announcement created a swift and powerful backlash. In its resolution formally rejecting the transaction, ICANN says that it received its first letter opposing the deal just two days after it was announced. The group would eventually receive letters from at least 30 groups opposing the deal as well as numerous negative comments during public hearings. Meanwhile, ICANN says the deal received virtually no counterbalancing support except for parties involved in the transaction and their advisors. Some of the factors reviewed in decision include a public interest review of converting the domain name from a nonprofit to a for-profit organization, the level of debt required as Ethos Capital was planning to do a leverage buyout of the registry, which would have required PIR to take out $360 million loan to help finance the transaction, and finally, a lack of transparency into the ownership of Ethos Capital. The .org domain name is one of the largest registries with more than 10.5 million domain names registered. As a side note, I did check and ICANN also manages the .com domain name, which was originally administered by the United States Department of Defense, but is today operated by VeriSign. So there you go. Things you never thought you needed to know. Thank me later. Now hopping over to our next story. Over 2,000 museums are going virtual. So apart from TV and food, you can get a little culture and education while you're confined to your couch now. Google Arts and Culture has teamed up with over 2,500 museums and galleries around the world to bring anyone and everyone virtual tours and online exhibits from some of the most famous museums from around the world. Google Arts and Culture's collection includes 
the British Museum in London, the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, the Guggenheim in New York City, and literally hundreds of more places where you can gain knowledge about art, history, and science. This collection is especially good for students who are looking for ways to stay on top of their studies while schools are closed. Sadly, not all popular art museums and galleries could be included in the collection, but some of these museums are taking it upon themselves to offer free online visits. The Louvre, for example, offers virtual tours on its website and museums in Alberta, Canada are also offering virtual tours of some of their exhibits. I've very, very conveniently included the links to both Google Arts and Culture and Alberta's own museum, because why not? Mosques across the United States have opened their doors to blood donors as part of a blood drive coordinated by the American Red Cross. Muslims are flocking to mosques across the U.S. to donate blood during Ramadan as part of a blood drive coordinated by the American Red Cross, the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community, Ahmadiyya Muslim Youth Association, and Humanity First. According to the American Red Cross website, 250,000 potential blood donations have been cancelled due to the coronavirus pandemic. To meet the needs of 2,700 hospitals and transfusion centers across the country, the organization needs to collect 15,000 donations every single day. To help achieve this, the Red Cross has teamed up with Muslim organizations to utilize mosques, which remain closed for large gatherings, but are open for essential services for blood donation centers. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community will provide venues to the American Red Cross under their 62 U.S. chapters, according to The Hill. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community was founded in 1920 and has millions of members in 213 countries. It has its own youth group and relief organization and has worked to combat negative perceptions of the religion following the September 11 terrorist attacks through its Muslims for Peace campaign. The Red Cross has put out a call for blood donations to help meet patients' need during the COVID-19 outbreak. On its website, the Red Cross reassures Americans that it follows the highest standards of safety and infection control as volunteers' donors are the only source of blood for those in need. You can make an appointment to give blood at the American Red Cross website by choosing your local blood donation center using your zip code. The Ahmadiyya Muslim Community's USA's Sleeves Up Facebook page shows 60 pledges have already been made out of a target of 1,000. So you can go there, make a pledge, or directly go to the Red Cross and book an appointment to donate blood. Our next story takes us to Venezuela, where on Monday, President Nicolas Maduro appointed his economy vice president, Tarek El Aysami, who has been indicted in the United States on drug trafficking charges as oil minister. Tarek El Aysami was indicted in the United States last month over allegations that he violated sanctions and received payments for facilitating drug shipments. These charges have been vehemently denied. El Aysami replaces Manuel Cuiverdo a National Guard general who had no industry experience when he took on the dual role of PDVSA president and oil minister in 2017. In March, the U.S. Justice Department charged El Aysami and 14 other former Venezuelan officials with narco-terrorism, corruption, and drug trafficking. El Aysami's indictment said he violated U.S. sanctions and received payments for facilitating drug shipments. The U.S. announced a reward of up to $10 million for information leading to his arrest. In our next story, Guatemalans deported from the U.S. have been threatened with violence at home over fears of coronavirus. Guatemala's indigenous Maya towns are spurning returned migrants, threatening some with burning their homes or lynching as fear spreads about more than 100 deportees from the United States 
who have tested positive for the new coronavirus. In one city in the Guatemalan Highlands, home of a large indigenous population, residents have already tried to burn down a migrant shelter. In some villages, locals are rebuffing the recently returned and threatening relatives of the deportees with expulsion from their homes. To date, Guatemalan health officials have said that nearly one-fifth of the 585 confirmed cases from coronavirus in the general Central American country can be traced to people who have been deported from the United States, most of them on two flights in a single day. This has fueled an angry backlash against migrants as they make their way home. The U.S. Immigration and Enforcement Agency, also known as ICE, has said deportees were screened before flights for elevated temperatures and symptoms associated with COVID-19. Yet, migrants returned by the United States to Colombia, Mexico, Haiti, and Jamaica have also tested positive for the virus in recent weeks, raising broader concerns over the deportation program. Following reports of infected deportees, the agency said that it would require 2,000 coronavirus tests per month to screen migrants on outgoing flights even though it likely would not have enough tests for all deportees. Prior to the pandemic, many deported Guatemalans could expect to be welcomed back home by balloon toting family members at an Air Force base in the capital where most would arrive. Today, that scene is a distant memory. In news from Lebanon, violent protests have now erupted in Lebanon's Tripoli capital again on Tuesday, with more banks set ablaze after a night of rioting that left one person dead, according to security and medical sources, in demonstrations that have been renewed by growing economic despair. Lebanon is facing its worst economic crisis since the 1975 to 1990 civil war, now compounded by a nationwide lockdown to stem the spread of the coronavirus. A collapse in the Lebanese pound and soaring inflation and unemployment are compounding the hardship in Lebanon, which has been in deep financial crisis since October. And it appears that very few are actually surprised by the hunger protests, which kicked off last week. The uprising's largely peaceful protest turned violent after a nearly two-month respite due to the coronavirus. In Tripoli, protesters staged large demonstrations outside politicians' homes, vowing to avenge the alleged corruption. Nearly every bank branch in the city has been damaged by the protests, with demonstrators voicing their fury at the banking sector's discretionary capital controls. The lockdown has also stoked resentment, fueling rumors of a government conspiracy to further impoverish the poor and has ultimately ignited the most recent protests. Protests against Lebanon's political class, which has ruled the country since the civil war and is widely accused of corruption, engulfed the main urban centers in late 2019. At the time, tens of thousands of Tripoli protesters flocked into the streets. The city was actually dubbed the Bride of the Revolution, both because of its energetic protests and because it was believed to have borne the brunt of political corruption. Calls for the army to deliver justice echo across Tripoli, even as demonstrators hurl stones and fireworks and Molotov cocktails at the armed forces. The military has responded with brute force. It has fired tear gas and rubber bullets and in some instances, live fire at protesters, killing one on Monday and wounding dozens over the week. The Lebanese Prime Minister Hassan Daib has called the demonstrations natural, given growing economic hardship, but has accused rioters of infiltrating the protesters in order to cause unrest. The Lebanese army also acknowledged the rights to freedom of expression and has cast suspicion on violent protesters. So in news that took me all the way to my childhood, it seems that Prince Harry has recorded a special message to celebrate the 75th anniversary of children's favorite 
Thomas the Tank Engine. Prince Harry, in a recording, introduces a new program called Thomas and Friends, the Royal Engine, which has a storyline that includes Harry's father and grandmother, Prince Charles and Queen Elizabeth II, as animated characters. Set when the Prince of Wales was a boy, the story sees the friendly engine taking Sir Topham Hatt, the controller of the railway, to Buckingham Palace to receive an honor. In a statement, he said he has fond memories growing up with Thomas and friends and being transported to new places through his adventures. He added, Thomas has been a comforting familiar face to so many families over the last 75 years entertaining, educating, and inspiring children on important issues through exciting stories and characters. I can definitely testify to that. Proof of Prince Harry's attachment to the engine can also be seen in photos of his first day attending nursery in September 1987, where he was seen carrying a Thomas the Tank engine bag. The Reverend Wilbert Audrey released the first book in the Railway series 75 years ago. It was originally created as a bedtime story for his son, Christopher, during the bout of the measles. The plucky blue tank engine doesn't appear in the Davy story. He got his own illustrated book in 1946 called Thomas the Tank Engine and swiftly took over from Edward, Gordon, and Henry as everyone's favorite. The show will be aired by Netflix in the US on May 1st and on Channel 5's Milkshake Show in the UK the following day. It will also be broadcast in Canada and Australia later in the month. If you ever read or watched Thomas the Tank Engine, leave a like or a comment and just let us know what the show actually means to you. So this next story really makes me realize I need to get up, get out and work out a little bit more because wow. A 72 year old British man has claimed a double world record after becoming the oldest person to row solo across the Atlantic Ocean. Everybody stand up. A round of applause, a round of applause, people. Graham Walters from Lancaster, England, arrived in Antigua on Wednesday, three months after departing from Gran Canaria Island in Spain in a plywood boat he built in his front yard. So not only is he rowing his way into a world record, he actually created the boat. Just encore that applause right there. Walters is also the oldest person to row across the ocean more than once. The grueling 5,000 kilometer challenge was his fifth Atlantic crossing and his last according to him. Walters visited a gym daily to get fit for the journey. He rode a punishing two hours on, two hours off every single day. After three months of surviving on boiling the bag meals, plus a stash of chocolate he took with him, Walter says he couldn't wait to tuck into an English stable, roast beef, and Yorkshire pudding with a glass of red wine. I hear you, man. Walter's feat has raised more than $3,000 for Help for Heroes, which assists British servicemen and women wounded in the line of duty. So Germany, on Thursday, April 30th, has completely now banned Lebanon's Iran-backed Hezbollah movement from carrying out activities on German soil as police raided mosques and venues linked to the group. Like the European Union, Germany has until now only outlawed Hezbollah's military wing while tolerating its political wing. But in a shift immediately welcomed by the United States and Israel, the German Interior Ministry said it now considered the entire movement as a Shiite terrorist organization. Although Hezbollah has no official presence in Germany, security forces estimate it has roughly a thousand members in the country. The United States and Israel have long designated Hezbollah as a terrorist group and urged allies to follow suit. Hezbollah was established in 1982 during Lebanon's civil war. It is now a major political party in the country 
where it holds majority parliament along with its allies. Iran's foreign ministry said the ban ignores the realities in West Asia. So female genital mutilation has now been outlawed in Sudan. Sudan's new government has outlawed the practice of female genital mutilation in a move hailed as a major victory for women's rights campaigners in a country where the often dangerous practice is widespread. The United Nations estimates that nearly 9 in 10 Sudanese women have been subjected to the most invasive form of the practice, which involves the partial or total removal of external female genitalia and leads to health and sexual problems that can end up being fatal. While this is a celebration, some have warned that laws alone cannot eliminate the practice. Now, anyone in Sudan who performs female genital mutilation faces a possible three-year prison term and a fine under an amendment to Sudan's criminal code approved last week in the country's transitional government, which came into power only last year following the ousting of longtime dictator Omar Hassan al-Bashir. Genital mutilation is practiced in at least 27 African countries, as well as part of Asia and the Middle East. Other than Sudan and Egypt, it is most prevalent in Ethiopia, Kenya, Burkina Faso, Nigeria, Djibouti, and Senegal, according to the United Nations Population Fund. Experts warn, however, that a law alone is not sufficient to end the practice, which in many countries is enmeshed with cultural and religious belief, considered a pillar of tradition and marriage, and supported by both women as well as men. In Egypt, for instance, genital cutting was banned in 2008 and the law amended in 2016 to criminalize doctors and parents who still facilitated the practice with prison sentences of up to 7 years for performing the operation and up to 15 if it results in disability or death. Yet, prosecutions are rare, and the operations continue very quietly, with 70% of Egyptian women between 15 and 49 having been cut already. Regardless of the outlook on compliance, this is an item of celebration and we should celebrate with those in Sudan who now have the law on their side. In this story, which I have included primarily for fun, Marvel's Eat the Universe cookbook now lets you dine like a superhero. Now fans can eat and drink beverages inspired by superheroes themselves with Marvel's Eat the Universe, the official cookbook written by celebrity chef Justin Warner, winner of season 8 of Food Network Star. Published by Insight Editions, the cookbook includes 60 recipes for tasty dishes inspired by Marvel Comics, movies, and TV characters. The recipes are available for pre-order now and goes on sale on July 28th. Geeky cooks can follow step-by-step -step instructions to create Deadpool's chimichangas, Storm's tornadoes of beef, and many more. So yeah, like if you like, share and subscribe, and I'll be buzzing in your ear sometime next week. Bye! Thanks for listening. As a reminder, the podcast will be released every week. Also, don't forget to follow Tunoka Media on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Connect to say hi or even share your stories that are happening in your local area or region. Nothing is too big or small. Thanks again.